Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you. I thank you for the opportunity to stand before you this morning and speak to you. I was thinking as Walter was presenting his fine lesson, and he spoke about where preachers don't do this just to stand up here and preach and teach. They do it first because they're Christians. I can appreciate preachers so much for that. I have entitled the lesson that I'm about to bring to you this morning, Are We Ready? You'll be turning in your Bibles to Luke chapter 22. We'll take a reading from that in just a minute. Well, let's just read it now, and then, I'll, then, then we'll talk about it a little bit. Luke chapter 22, beginning in verse 31. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. But he said to him, Lord, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Then he said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster shall not crow this day before you will deny me three times. So, here we have an incident that we're all very familiar with, I'm, I feel reasonably sure. But let me ask you, how many times have you and I said or thought that if we were faced with a certain situation, we would act in a certain way. And then at some point later, we're confronted with that situation and we act completely different than we thought we would or said we would. So it's not uncommon, is it, that Peter would say such thing as he said here. I remember also Talking about being ready, I believe it was the 17th of August in 2016, I had bypass surgery. And as I was laying there getting prepped, as they say, for that procedure, my surgeon walked in and he looked at me and he said, are you ready? You know what I said? Are you ready? <laughs> because I won't, I was, well, I was, I had faith that he could do what he was about to do, but I wanted to hear him say it. But anyway, sometimes we say things and we mean it when we say it, but we back up on it at some other point in life. So Peter here has said, I'm ready to go to prison. I'm ready to even die for you. But you see, Peter just thought he was ready for that. He hadn't counted the cost. What about you and I? Have we counted the cost? It only took Peter just a few hours, I suppose, a very short time to do exactly what he swore that he wouldn't do. And sometimes we're like that, aren't we? We ought not be too hard on Brother Peter. He was a man. So men are subject to back up on things sometimes. But without question, I believe that Peter repented of that. I know he did. Scriptures make that very clear. And the scriptures also make it clear that that he was forgiven of that sin and restored back in fellowship with the Lord. So <laughs> later, as, as we all know, in Acts chapter 2, Peter began to preach the first gospel sermon that was ever preached. How was he able to do that? How was he able to do that? Well, he was ready to do it because he had prepared to do it. But first and foremost, he was ready and prepared because God 
had baptized him and the rest of the apostles in the Holy Spirit. And so Peter and the rest of the apostles were, were able to do that because they were inspired of the Holy Spirit. And then secondly, and, 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 and foremost, they were ready to do that because they had sanctified the Lord God in their heart, you see, such as we are commanded to do as Christians. Now, we're not apostles, but we are Christians. We're disciples of Christ. And the Bible tells me, and it tells you, it tells all of us in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. So we are to sanctify the Lord God in our heart always. And as I've heard Jeff say many times, and Jeff's a scholar of, of the Greek. He probably won't, won't say that, but he is. I had a whole year of Greek when I went through school, and I still don't know nothing about it. Cindy went through that same class with me and just breezed through it. But I found, I found Greek very difficult. I found Hebrew very difficult. And as you're listening to me now, you're going to say you got English very difficult. But the truth of the matter is, you see, some things are difficult for some people, but a breeze for other people. But how, how were they able to do that? They sanctified the God, God in their heart. And, and as he said, always do that. Continually do that. Not just once, not just twice, but day by day. Sanctify always the Lord God in our heart. Now, they were able to do that because of being filled with the Holy Spirit, baptized in the Holy Spirit. So I want to ask us a couple of questions as we get going here. Are we ready, always ready, to make and give the defense of the gospel? Are we? You can answer that for yourself. I trust that we are. And then the second question I would ask us, are we ready to do it with meekness and fear? Are we? Now, <clears throat> it takes preparation to do certain things, doesn't it? And that's why we can go back to this verse here that we've just read. We need to sanctify the Lord God in our hearts. Prepare to do that. Make preparation. We simply cannot do certain things because we're not able to do certain things. But one thing we can do is sanctify the Lord God in our hearts and be able to give an answer for the hope that we have in Christ. So preparation certainly is the key to a lot of situations in life, is it not? I believe, I believe you will agree with me on that. In Luke chapter 14, Verses 28 through 30, Jesus explains this so good, I think. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it, lest, after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Because he wasn't prepared, right? He goes on further to say in verses 31 through 33, Or what king, going to make war against another king, does not sit down first and consider whether he's able with 10,000 to meet him who comes with him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is still a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks conditions of peace. So likewise, Whoever of you does not forsake all, then has, cannot follow me and be my disciple. So, likewise, to sanctify the Lord God in our hearts is to make preparation take some effort on our part. We must spend time in study of God's Word. 
We must spend, spend time in talking to God, speaking to God, praying to Jesus Christ. In 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15, a command, another command is given us. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not be to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And so we can see that we have to be diligent. And again, I believe that's continually to be diligent to present ourselves approved to God. Each one of us. Now I realize that Paul wrote this epistle to Timothy, but this this command applies to all, all Christians. You see, it wasn't just to Timothy. Timothy was a preacher. Uh, we understand that. But we Christians ought to be diligent to present ourselves approved to God. And, and we must if we're going to be pleasing to Him. But not only are we to study and to pray, we're to meet the conditions that set forth in that command. That's to say that we must be ready to do it with meekness and with fear. You see, our attitudes and our dispositions must be ready. All of us probably know people that have bad disposition. Not me, you say, but you. But yes, me, you see. And, and sometimes, you see, our, our uh, attitudes are not what they ought to be, even as Christians. We try, we try real hard to have right attitude, right disposition, but sometimes we fail. You know why? Because we let the world get a hold of us. And we forget for a little bit of who we are and what we are. And so we need to, to work on our dispositions and our attitude from time to time. We need to be ready to win souls for Christ. Not, we're not out to win arguments. We're not out to in, win arguments. Now let me say this. I believe I'm, I told Jeff maybe some more of this just recently. I didn't become a Christian until I think I was in my mid-30s. But the man that taught Cindy and myself the gospel just happened to be one of my uncles. And he was a preacher in the church. But Uncle Jack loved to argue. Yes, he did. And he didn't mind telling you. He told me one day, and I, I've seen him in action. I saw him in action. He told me one day, John, how many remember that, that uh, commercial, I'd walk a mile for a camel? My daddy smoked camel. I used to sneak one once in a while, but one I couldn't take but about one of them. But anyway, Uncle Jack told me, he said, I would walk 10 miles to argue with a denominational preacher. He meant that thing. He loved to do that. But arguing may be okay under certain conditions if our attitudes are correct, if we do it in meekness and fear, you see. But when we take attitude that we're going to prove somebody how bad that person is, we, we need to get away from that kind of thing. And I trust we're not into that kind of thing. So, Arguing just to win an argument sometimes pushes people back. Instead of lifting people up, pushes them down. So I would, I would, I would encourage us to avoid that kind of defending the gospel, defending our faith. And I'm very aware, and you are too, that Jude three tells us that we are to contend earnestly for the faith. But I would say this, must we do it contentiously? And certainly not. Never should we do that. Solomon wrote long ago in Proverbs 11 and verse 30, 
He who wins souls is wise. In Ephesians 4 and verse 15, Paul, writing to the church at Ephesus, and he's telling that church by inspiration, and he's telling West Dennis Street Church, speak the truth in love. We don't have to be contentious about it. We have to do it in love for the soul of those that we're speaking to. In Matthew chapter 10, in verse 16, Jesus, when he sent out the apostles, he said, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. So that's the way that we are to share the gospel with other people. We must be ready to share that gospel with the law. In Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, Paul said, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just, shall live by faith. So the just go about sharing the gospel as we are commanded to. We are not ashamed of it. We are happy and proud. Not proudful in a, in a, prideful in a, in a bad way, but we are proud to wear the name of Christian because we have been obedient to the call of the gospel. In Acts chapter 4 and verse 12, Peter and John have been arrested for preaching the gospel. They've been thrown in prison. They've been beaten. And then they're let go. But before they're let go, they're told, don't speak in this man's name anymore. Now, I'm paraphrasing, but that's about what they were told. Don't speak. Don't preach in this man's name anymore. And you know what their response was? Yeah, you know what it was, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing again. You say what you want to, you do what you want to, but we can't help but preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that ought to be my attitude, that ought to be all Christians' attitude, that we're going to preach the gospel, and we're going to preach it in its entirety, we're going to preach it sincerely, but we're going to do it from a spirit of love for God and for our fellow man. God loves everybody, believe it or not. God loves everybody, saint and sinner. But God has promised to save the faithful, and that is what he will do because God is a God of love. And we need to remember that, and I'm sure that we do. But it, <clears throat> you see, when, when, when they told them they they're going to preach Jesus. They meant that, no question about it. And so no other name, no other authority. Christ only and only by his authority. In Matthew 28, beginning in verse 18, I tried to quote this Wednesday, but I messed it up. But I'm going to try it again. But Jesus speaking to the apostles before he ascended back to heaven. And he said, all authority or all power has been given to me in heaven and earth. Go, th go therefore and make disciples of all men, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So Jesus gave the apostles the authority to go preach the gospel. The gospel is for all men. God is not a respecter of person. He shows no partiality. In Acts chapter 10, verse 34 makes that very clear. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth I perceive that God shows no partiality. And of course that was the occasion when Cornelius heard the gospel, believed the gospel, and obeyed the gospel, and God added him to the church, a Gentile. Up until that time, it's my understanding, the gospel had only been preached to the Jews. 
But now, since that time, it was preached to the Gentiles, and so it's for all people. doesn't matter if you're black, white, red, blue, red, yellow, whatever. God loves you, and he wants to have you with him eternally in heaven. And he will have if you will obey him and keep on obeying him, you see. So, <clears throat> in Galatians 3, verses 26 through 29, all writing to the churches of Galatia, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if, well, and if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed, and heirs according to the promise. What promise? What promise, Paul? The promise that God made to Abraham in the long ago in Genesis chapter 12, when he said, in you, in you, Abraham, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. All there means all. All people. If you're in Christ, then you're, you're in God. Christ is God. Therefore, we must be ready for every good work. Titus addresses that, I believe, in chapter 3 of Titus, verses 1 through 8. I'm not going to take the time to read that at this, at this time. But it tells us that we must be ready for every good work. That means individually. and That means collectively as a congregation of the Lord's people. Each one of us need to be ready to share the gospel with other, with other people. We must be faithful in all things, and that includes works of obedience. When I say works of obedience, I'm not talking about works of merit. That's not what God is talking about. That's not what the scripture is talking about. It's talking about works of obedience. In James chapter 2 and verse 14, we read, Faith without works is of no profit. Faith without works of obedience is of no profit. We read in verse 17, Faith without works is dead faith. Faith without works of obedience is dead faith. It's no good. It doesn't do anything for anybody. And then in verse 18 of that same chapter, we read, Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. In other words, he's saying, I will show you my faith by my works of obedience. You cannot separate works and obedience. They go together, hand in hand. Always have, always will. I believe that, that Hebrews chapter 11 makes that very clear. They were told, each one of those people mentioned there, they were commanded to do certain things. And by faith, they did it. They didn't talk about it. They acted upon it, and they did it, and they were found pleasing to God. And so... I'm about through. Now, the last time I stood up here, I think I kept y'all about 20 minutes over. I'm not going to do that today. I'm going to get you out of here in just a minute, all right? So, in conclusion, we can see, without question, I believe, that victories are won long before the battle starts. You ask any military leader, you ask any coach, teacher, uh, and you'll, you'll get the same answer that takes preparation to win battles, it takes preparation to win games, it takes preparation to learn in, a, in our teaching process, you see. And so the, the wonderful thing about 
about in, in the Christian religion is that it didn't cost us anything. It's free. Jesus paid the price for us. It's a gift, you see. He paid the price that we can have hope for eternal life by being faithful unto death. Hebrews chapter 10, or verse 2 in chapter 10. I'm sorry. So all we got to do is to be faithful day by day to receive that crown of life as Christians. So sometimes we sing the song. Are you ready? Are you ready for the soul right home? And we're asking this question now to one or more that may be present with us that has never obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. Are you ready? Are you ready? But not only for those that haven't obeyed the gospel, but what about those of us that have obeyed the gospel? Are we ready? We must stay in a state of readiness. Jump off here something. I remember, I, I can remember something. Serving in the United States Navy aboard an aircraft carrier and going out to sea and playing war games. The first cruise I made was a trip to Gitmo. If you don't know where Gitmo is, it's in Cuba. All right? On a shakedown cruise that was supposed to last, I forgot, just two or three weeks, we ended up down there for two months. That was because it was right after the Cuban Missile Crisis, you see. So Mr. Castro got to acting up. We had to act up, too. That was the longest two months of my life, I believe. But anyway. We were ready. We were ready. Militarily. But there's a, there's a readiness that far exceeds that kind of readiness. And that's the readiness of our spirit, of our soul. Are we ready? We say, yes, we're ready. I obeyed the gospel whenever it was. That puts you in a state of readiness. Did you stay in that readiness? Have I stayed in that readiness? To be ready on the day when the Lord returns to meet the Lord. We'll talk about that this afternoon. <laughs> but we need always be ready, as the hymn says. We need. We don't have to wonder about it, don't have to guess about it, don't have to wish about it. We can be ready and know we're ready by having obeyed the gospel. I would encourage anyone, and I'm sure this congregation joins with me in encouraging anyone that may be present that has never obeyed the gospel to take advantage of the opportunity that you have to turn to put Christ on, to believe that he is the Christ. Jesus said, except you believe I'm he, you'll die in your sin. He also said, except you repent, you'll perish. He also said, if you'll confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. But that's not all he said along that line. If you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father in heaven. So let's don't be deniers. Let's be confessors. Then he said, he that believes and is baptized will be saved. At Mark 16, verses 15 and 16. He sent the, the apostles out, told them to preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized will be saved. He that believes not will be condemned. He that believes and is baptized will be saved. He that believes what and is baptized will be saved. The gospel. He that believeth not will be condemned. He that believeth not what? The gospel will be condemned. 
So let's be sure that we believe and keep on believing, keep on obeying, keep on living as we are commanded to live as Christians. We want to invite you, as Jesus said, to come unto him. And you do that by being obedient to the call of the gospel. You need to do that. We encourage you to do so while we stand and sing the song.